free the chain game, man. These niggas out here killing that. We gonna kill them. Fuck you talking about? This shit is right, nigga. Pearls everywhere. Let's get them. Fuck the low. Free the chain game. Hey everybody, this is Mark. And this is Justin. And this is Awkward Fist Bump Productions. We've got a great guest on tonight. His name is John. John is a CEO at Ware State Prison. If you saw our last video, you'll see that there was a riot just this last week at Ware State Prison. I, I reached out to him, and he said, yeah, he would come on. He's got a great message. I've been kind of following him for this past week, and he's really I, – I would actually like to have him on again after this, maybe as a contributing – what would you call it, a contributing guest, something like that from now yeah. on if you're, if, you're, if you're game with that. But, John, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody about yourself and then say, tell us what happened. All right. My name is uh, John Eason. Um, I've been employed with the Georgia Department of Corrections for 10 years. I uh, did all 10 years at Willis State. Uh, came fresh out of high school. I was looking for a job. I had a friend who was employed out there, and he said, hey, man, I know who's hiring if you're looking for a job. And I went out there and I applied, got the job, and two weeks later they shipped me to BCOT and came back and began my career. All right. For those that don't know, BCOT stands for Basic Correction Officers Training. It's located in Forsyth, which is middle Georgia. And everybody that's a correction officer in the state of Georgia goes there for their little four or five weeks of training. It includes uh, the gun range and all the basics you need to know to uh, be a, uh, at least a beginner. I wouldn't say to be a good correction officer, but uh, you, you don't learn how to be a correction officer until you're there doing the job. But, um, hey, thanks for introducing yourself, man. So, you know, of course, the reason why we have you on is it was all over. I mean, it was all over the world that there was a riot at Ware State Prison. Why don't you tell us what happened? What what happened down there, man? All right. Well, basically, I just want to go ahead and tell everybody, uh, you know, I'm not employed out there anymore. I left two weeks prior before this riot. So, you know, I wasn't there. Um, I built personal relationships with my coworkers. And, we, you know, you bond uh, being in a job like that. And uh, mm -hmm. I still have a lot of people I care about that, that work out there. And. A lot of them want to, want their voice to be heard, and unfortunately, in that kind of in that kind of business, you can't really get out on social media and express your no. concerns because of fear of retaliation from the department. Yep, um, they have their ways of doing things. Unfortunately, um, so basically, uh, last Saturday night on into Sunday morning, they had a riot. Uh, the GDC tried to downplay it to call it a, a disturbance. But in this particular case, I'll say, fortunately, inmates had cell phones. It's a big pro contraband's a big problem inside the inside the inside the prisons. Uh, and I say fortunately because if it wasn't for those phones, uh, this this incident probably would have got swept under the rug like they were trying to do. Well, it seems but, like that's what they're doing now. If you look at the press releases, they say minor disturbance. A couple of officers were minorly hurt. But it seems like when you watch that vid those videos, it seems a lot worse than that. Yeah, it was a whole lot worse than that. And I've heard horror stories from people who were who were there that night and, and giving me their testimonies. And it, it really gives you chill bumps. And I wish y'all can hear uh, these stories. And maybe, they, maybe they will come out in the future. Uh, you know, who knows? Uh, that night, uh, they were short staffed. And, and I don't mean to say that night. It's been short staff for a long time, mm -hmm. but this particular night, I think they reported 13 officers were on shift, uh, and I use 13 very, very lightly because I do believe it was less than that. I think from what I'm hearing, they were around nine uh, altogether, 
But after you take away your a couple of your priority posts, you probably were down to five officers running the whole compound. And the prison holds 1,546 inmates. Jeez. You know, so, so five watching 1,500. Basically, you know, that's when we get down to the meat and bones of this, that's basically what it was. And there was a lot, there was a lot of buildings and this is common. There's a lot of buildings that go unmanned that house a hundred inmates per building. And some officers have to watch one or two buildings by themselves, sometimes three and four. Oh, geez. So that means a lot of inmates are going unsupervised during the day. Even, even in the inmate scenario, if they need medical attention, for anything, they're not going to get it for a while because officers are at another building tending to those inmates. Uh, this case that happened during the riot, there were three supervisors. I believe they were going counting the compound. Uh, the compound was partially on lockdown due to a murder that happened two weeks prior. Uh, the rumor circulating around that is, uh, and, I, and I'm a firm believer of this too, I I wouldn't tell y'all anything that's a rumor if I wouldn't believe it being true. I call it a rumor because I wasn't there. So can I verify it through me? No, but through other people's testimonies who were there? Yeah. Uh, also, there was a lot of tension uh, out there because of the coronavirus issue. Yeah. Uh, anytime an inmate would test positive, they would do exactly how we do in the free world with the coronavirus. You would quarantine for 14 days to help stop the spread of the coronavirus. So if an inmate in the building would get would test positive for the coronavirus, they would lock the whole building down and you were quarantining for two weeks. And some inmates couldn't gasp the thought of being locked down for 14 days and they didn't do anything wrong. They don't have coronavirus. Why should they be locked down? Mm -hmm. takes away some of the freedoms. They can't get out and roam around like they normally do. They can't go use the kiosk like they normally do, which is what they use to contact their families and stuff like that. They can't get out and use the phones like they normally do. Watch TV. Uh, so you're in your cell with one other guy and you're quarantining for 14 days and that's how, that's how the tensions were built up and there was a lot of issues coming through Days prior to these buildings being locked down, that the officers were having a hard time keeping the doors locked. Uh, inmates were popping out of their cells. Uh, they were busting these door locks and these latches where they can gain access to run out on people. And the upper management knew about it. They actually had to go in a couple of days prior for uh, to help lock the buildings back down. Jeez. And then 45 minutes later, it'd be back the same. You know, officers be in there and they'd be 15, 20 inmates running around. Uh, and I, I, I say that because it's a maintenance issue, but I don't want to make it sound like the maintenance uh, department out there weren't doing their job because I can testify that oh, yeah. just like the correction officers, the maintenance staff is short. You know, where it would usually take 12 maintenance guys to work a compound that big, we're down to four or five. Mm -hmm. and with it with it being that old, there's so much stuff that's going on to where they have to keep constantly fix stuff. Yeah, and, and there's inmates tearing stuff up. Yeah, that's true. Uh but there's also it's an old compound, like you said, so there's wear and tear on the prison. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of priorities that have to be put in place when you're fixing maintenance issues, like anytime the intake gates will go down, they have to stop what they're doing and go see about that. They can't worry about a sink or a toilet, they have to go take care of that first they're getting overworked uh your your correction officers are getting overworked because they're they're hold on a second guys i'm sorry no it's okay are right, you guys there yeah yes, we're here. all right they're they're getting overworked the correction officers are getting overworked uh the short staff and anyway, I'm rambling on. I'm trying to explain this the best way I can. Yeah. Um, three supervisors go into this one particular building. They, they do count. They get overtaken by the inmates who bust out their cells. Uh, their keys get taken. They're held hostage. Um, that 
caused the inmates to gain access to the day room doors and the sally ports and four other buildings because they had the keys and three lockdown units. They freed all those inmates. And then that's when the riot really took took off. Uh, you had anywhere from four to 600 inmates running around doing whatever they wanted to for hours. Uh, the GDC is going to tell you the riot popped off at 11. Uh, I've had multiple people tell me it really started earlier than that. I, I'm going to say 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, they said they finally regained control around 2 o'clock and everything that I've gathered says they're telling probably telling the truth about that. Uh, there was the buildings were basically destroyed. The control rooms were ramshackled through, glass broken. They set a golf cart on fire and set it in front of a yard gate so the officers couldn't get in there and get one of the hostages sooner. Um, they broke into the education of certain officers, were able to ramshackle those, uh, get weapons from the cert office, such mm -hmm. as like riot shields and tasers and pepper ball guns and radios. They were communicating back and forth. They were yelling on the radios. They were going to kill all the officers. Uh, you'll see one supervisor get hot. He's hogtied. He, there, he's being escorted by two officers. They were walking him up to a different building. And you'll see inmates stabbing them in the back on the way up. And it's just very, it's very disturbing. Now, you know, there's, there's an upscale route going on, but at the same time, there's, there are a few buildings who the inmates in the buildings don't want to participate in this route because they know there's going to yeah. be repercussions. Mm -hmm. So there were some, some testimonies of uh, correction officers telling me that, hey, uh, when they came and tried to unlock our building, our inmates told them, hell no, uh, go somewhere else with it. So they would, the inmates would unlock the door and they would lock it right back. They didn't want nothing to do with it. It's good to uh, know. But unfortunately, there were, there were a lot that did want something to do with it. And there were also rumors circulating that uh, three inmates got shot. Three inmates were hurt, but they didn't get shot with guns. They got shot with less than lethal projectiles to help uh, regain control of the prison. Uh, I guess... A lot of people want you to believe that officers just went in, guns blazing, and shooting up inmates and trying to kill them. They were just trying to regain control. And and from what I'm hearing, I can assure you, the ones that were on social media, most about how they got shot, they they uh they weren't innocent like they say they were. Mm -hmm. You know, as the mornings went on and they started regaining control, putting out the fires started putting the pieces back together. They started doing their emergency counts and slowly try to get things back together. And that's where they're at now. Well, I know GDC has said that it was a minor disturbance. A couple of officers were hurt. How many officers were hurt? What was the status of their injuries and stuff like that? Well, there was approximately four officers that got hurt. There was a lot more that had minor injuries, uh, but there was four that got Hurt pretty decent, worth notarizing. Uh, there was one supervisor who had a crushed skull and a punctured lung, and he was held hostage for hours. They just beat on him for hours. Uh, there was another supervisor, as you've seen in the video. Yeah. He was held hostage and stabbed and beat. And there was a, uh, another supervisor who really, really basically got saved because all he did was get knocked out and thrown in a cell by a couple other inmates. They really spared him. Uh, there was an officer. He got stabbed under the eye, and he has other multiple cuts, but, you know, they're all going to be okay. There's still, there's still one supervisor in the hospital, but he's expected to make a full recovery. So let me ask you this. There were some rumors, and, and, and I want to quell some of these rumors, obviously, because there's a lot of conjecture out there, and I'm sure you've seen it, John. Yeah. But, the you know, the... I heard the rumors about it being a gang hit. It was retribution from a gang hit. But I've also heard that there were rumors that claims, and, and I'm reading this, so I apologize about looking down. It says the the rumor claims that they that the inmates were only getting one shower a week and two meals a day. Is there any truth to that? Okay, to the retaliation on a gang hit, there wasn't any gang activity that night. That was all gangs together. Uh we can debunk that theory just by watching the Facebook videos and seeing that every, all the inmates were banding together. There was multiple gangs out there taking over to prison. Okay. Um, and then there was rumors, like you say, of uh, the inmates rioted due to due to 
their violation of their rights. And uh, part of those were they weren't getting showers maybe once a week, and they weren't getting fed maybe twice a day if they were lucky. Uh, I can debunk them theories. Um, they get they got showers once every three days if your building was on lockdown, and that's once every seventy two hours, which is what policy states. And where state prison, even though they're super short staff, they have good staff, and they're lucky because those officers will stay and make sure those inmates got showers. Some would stay till you know they go in at six in the morning. Some will come in even earlier to start showers. Some mm-hmm. will stay till eight or nine o'clock until showers were done. So they were getting showers as called by the standard operating procedures once every three days. Uh, them getting fed once or twice a day is false. Mm-hmm. Uh, three meals every day, even on the weekends. And I say even on the weekends because normally they only do get meals on the weekends, breakfast and dinner. But to keep to keep the the agitation down. Due to the coronavirus, and inmates weren't allowed to have visits because they canceled visitation. Yeah, because of, they didn't want visitors in from all over the state and chance bringing in coronavirus. They would feed the inmates lunch on the weekends as well. Uh, sometimes it'd be a you know it could be anywhere from a peanut butter sandwich and a banana and a milk to you know a pack out. When I mean pack out, it's like two or three sandwiches and cake. Uh, things like that. And they also do get um, packages from the state. Uh, and they've recently gotten, probably within the last three or four months, three or four packages from the state, which are just little just little pack outs, you know, not pack outs, but packages with soups and candy and honey buns and drinks in it just to, just to keep the agitation. They try to keep the agitation down the best they could. Uh, they would. The GDC did approve for them since they couldn't see their families. They gave them two free stamps a week, gave them a free 15-minute phone call a week, you know, things like that to try to keep things calm the best they could. But unfortunately, it didn't work out the way they thought it did. Mm-hmm. So, you know, violation of the rights? I'd say no. Uh, that that wasn't the case either because I just think it had a lot to do with. The, the murder of the, the inmate a couple of weeks prior and an irritation due to the coronavirus, you know, is, is yeah. It's a bad situation. Justin, what questions do you have? I know you had a couple you sent me ahead uh, of time. He's answered some of them. <laughs> yeah, he has. Okay, so he has answered quite a few, so Okay, so what what could the state level uh, DOC employees do to prevent uh, from this happening again? Like, what do you think could be done? Well, there's, there's, such, there's such a big uh, disconnect from the GDC itself from its employees. Uh, the employees feel abandoned because they don't have the staff to properly run a prison. And We're going back to real quick to the violation of inmates' rights, where if I would say anything was violated, it was nobody's really there to to keep security of these inmates. These inmates are in here under the Department of Corrections authority, so they should be able to provide safety measures to ensure their safety as well. And, and your last video, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Your last video, you were talking about they took the SOP books out? Yeah, they, uh, earlier January, uh, there was a couple of us officers, us veteran officers, uh, FTOs and things of that nature. Uh, when they really started breaking down the breaking SOP, we got concerned. And, uh, you know, different things weren't adding up in our books because we properly know how, how to run a prison because we ran it with. 37 to 50 officers like it's supposed yeah. to be. And when we're running at 10, we have no choice but to break policy. But we want questions answered. We don't just want to say yes, sir, or no, ma'am. We want questions answered like, okay, so if we go in with these keys and these inmates take over and ha- have access to all these buildings, that's going to be uh, a bad problem for the state, the safety of the officers, the inmates, everybody. And it was more or less of you're going to do it or you're going to find another job. 
And that's not how you're supposed to talk to <laughs> to your employees that are already going to one. You know, uh, the, the Department of Corrections, we're the third lowest paying Department of Corrections in the nation. Yep. And we have some of the worst inmates in the nation. How is that even possible? How is that even happening? Uh, so take away your employees' retirement. They're, they don't offer retirement no more for these guys. They and, took away the retirements? Yeah, they took away the retirement in 2012. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and they're, they're, they're also, there's also all kinds of budget cuts. They're always cutting back. Uh, and the Georgia Department of Corrections just don't, I don't think they understand what it takes to run a prison or, or they don't want to stand up for their staff. And, and just for a second, I want to, I want to echo what John's saying is, is when I worked at the uh, Department of or GDC, should I say, when I worked up in Jackson, uh, I got a 10% pay bump. Okay, so you get the base salary. And then if you're a, a military veteran, because I came out of the Army, um, I got a 10% pay bump. Because I worked at a place called the High Max, which the High Max, and, and, and these two know what it is, but the High Max is if you go to general population and you kill somebody, you kill an officer, another inmate, you can't get along, or even if you, sometimes if you're just high profile, uh, like Brian Nichols was uh, in the high max. Uh, they, they put you in the high max. But because you're in the high max, they give me, gave me another 10% pay bump. And even with those two 10% pay, pay, pay bumps, I only made right at 29000 a year. And that's why, I, I'll be honest, I had to get out as quick as possible. So I think, you know, a big thing, and we did a previous episode, me and Justin, before about contraband coming in, and a big source of contraband is crooked staff. And, and I've always thought, and I, I stand to this day, that I'm a person of integrity. I don't care how little I get paid and how much money I make off of contraband. I would never do it. However, that's why a lot of people do it. So I'm married. I'm the sole breadwinner for my family. I've got three kids, and I'm making $30,000 a year. So I think if GDC would actually pay officers, I'm just trying to echo what you're saying here, brother. I think if GDC would pay officers, then you would see a rise in quality officers that won't bring in contraband that can pro you know, provide for their family. And thus they will stay there. The longevity will be there. Um, I I'm trying to voice as many concerns as I can. There's, there's people going through my head right now. Uh, a couple of officers mentioned, you know, because it disturbs them, the people that are doing their job, for people outside to think that they're not doing their job. So they pointed out a bunch of key issues that people can go back and look at. Well, they say, well, the inmates say we're not feeding them. Well, if you go back and look at the trash piles they were burning, it was styrofoam trays. Yeah. Uh, if you go back and look at when they were taking over the buildings, there were styrofoam trays all over the, the, the steps. Uh, there's, there's, there's evidence of them getting fed everywhere. Yeah. Um, another thing uh, I want to, I want to bring uh, Josh, I'll get back to you. Let me get to your question yeah. real quick. The SOP, um, we started questioning them about the SOP and they didn't like the, how we was quoting them on their, their own book. So they went around and, and confiscated all the SOPs from the control rooms. Which oh, geez. Understand that standard operating procedures, how to properly run your building safely and they're put there for a reason and i was lucky enough when i was coming up to be trained by some good officers who believe in those books and who believe in free firm and consistency and and when the new officer because it's a high turnover rate man uh, when, when, you, when you have to train new officers and you can't pull out the book and show them how it's supposed to be done they think it's already done the right way when they come in and see things the way it is uh, that's a bit. That, that's your answer to your SOP. Now, I also want to touch on, and this is a big, this is a big subject to me because I went through it for for 18 months here lately, and everybody's going through it out there and across the state. They're not being properly equipped uh, with what it takes to run a prison, and by that I mean, if you get assigned to a building, you may get a radio, you may not. It just depends. It just depends on uh, what building you work. Uh, if you do get a radio, the antenna's broken, the battery's faulty, you may not be able to hear somebody. Uh, wow. They took the handcuffs away from the officers. Uh, there's no handcuffs in the buildings. There, there may be three or four put up somewhere else, but 
You can't get handcuffs. You can't get batons. You can't get pepper spray, which is what you're certified with. That's yeah. that's not a it's not an option. You can't get that anymore. I mean, basically, you're going in, you're going in to protect inmates and yourself with this right here. So and, where's the taxpayers' money's going? Uh, well, when we ask about why we were getting, uh, basically, why we were being unarmed with the stuff that we have the right to use in that type of job, uh, when we asked about the radios, uh, it took them a while, but they said it was seven thousand dollars to get new radios inside the prison and it's not in the budget uh just to turn around a couple weeks later and our warden has a new car a forty thousand dollar impala so something's messed up with the department of corrections with the budgeting system because if you can afford to buy a warden a car for forty thousand dollars there weren't nothing wrong with his last one but you can't fund seven grand to get new radios yeah Agreed. So what, what year do you think, I'm sorry, Mark, what year oh, do you fine. think that this started changing? Because, you know, I was at, I, you know, I just finished my 10 year sentence and I was at Waycross from the end of 2010 to the middle or the beginning of 2013. And this sounds like a completely different world from what I went through. Well, let me tell you, I was employed there from 06 to 2014. Came back in 18 to now to two weeks ago, and it is a whole different ball game than what I was used to. Uh, a lot of people say it started happening around 2016, uh, particularly our prison. The other prisons were suffering earlier than that, but 2016 to them was a hit hit marker because we came short on staff then. It started just declining from there, and we never rebounded our numbers because it's hard to attract people to come work out there in that environment with that little pay. And no incentive, can't de can't defend yourself in a hostile environment. Um, there was something else we was just about to talk about. I can't remember. <laughs> I just think well, that's crazy. I mean, because I mean, there was a riot that popped off in 2011, right before Thanksgiving. Yeah, I was there, and it was it only happened that I can remember for maybe an hour. Until yep. it started getting taken control and like the officers took back control. It only took maybe an hour, but yep. I mean, everybody had radios. There was officers everywhere. Uh, I mean, there's, hey. they're walking around with, um, their, the, uh, the guns during chow, like the, uh, paintball guns during chow. Oh. So, I mean, it's just crazy to hear that this would happen and like that you're y'all have lost so much stuff and it's completely flipped over and I, i'm glad you said that josh because let me let me let Justin. me <laughs> i'm sorry man. it's let okay me, it's okay go ahead let me tell you you said in 2011 we had that right it was an upscale right uh we were able to take control back within an hour like you said you're right and we were properly equipped and guess what we didn't have to call outside help that day we didn't call gsp uh the sheriff's office the police station, the tax squads, the IRT teams. We took it back with the staff we had because we were properly staffed and properly equipped. Now take that to last Saturday and you see the difference. Jeez, and, and as an officer myself, you know, if I call 1078, and you know what that means, but officer needs assistance on the radio, like I, I get no less than 25, I mean, usually about, about 10 to 15 officers respond quick. It just blows my mind because if you don't have a working radio and you get attacked as an officer, there's nothing you can do except try to try to get away and run. Yeah, and that's basically that's basically it. Um, I mean, you hit a nail on the head there, man. It was, it was it, if you were if you were lucky enough to have a radio and call ten seventy eight, two people might hear it. Jeez. And if if you're really lucky, uh, the tower the towers heard it and were able to get on the horn and call for help. But then again, like I said, there, there's a problem with the radio system out there. They have said there's problems because we're so close to an airport. So there's interference. I don't believe that, not one bit. But it's just that's another way of them saying, hey, deal with it. You know, we're close to the airport. So that's that's the excuse. Yeah. Well, listen, I think I think we're at a great stopping point here just because of time. But um, can we have you on again? 
maybe in a few weeks. I have so many more things to talk about. People want me to talk about. Uh, Any time's good for me, man. I, you know, I'm I'm blessed. I have a, I have another job that I love. Yeah. Uh, I would I, love to voice these concerns and, and even like even like uh, problems with inmates' concerns because I have a ninety ten rule. And a ninety ten rule I was I was trained upon, which means when you go into work, you have ninety percent of the inmates are not gonna give you not one problem. Yep. Uh yep. as long as you're fair and firm with them. Uh, hey officer Easton, how you doing, man? How's your day? Good, man. Well, how about that Falcons game? I was like, yeah, man, they they did their thing. <laughs> the, day, the 10 rule, the 90-10 rule, the 10 rule is there's going to be 10% that's going to give you problems. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it's just, it is what it is. But uh, I also believe in sticking up for those 90, you know, the 90% that want to just lay it down and do their time. Uh, yeah. they, got, they got sentenced. They want to give their debt to society and return back and, and, and hopefully – have some kind of reform when they get out. Well, brother, I, I want to have you back. I thought, what do you yeah. say, Justin? Oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah, because let's, that's let's... one thing. That's why we got this channel is because we want to be able to speak on both sides, officers and, and you know former inmates. And so, like, we definitely want to find a common ground and how can we make this better for both sides? Exactly. And, and, and it's always going to point back to one thing, and I know I've said it, and I can't say it enough, but shortage of staff. Yeah. Shortage of staff, and, and, and we never really got the chance to cover on negligence of the higher-ups that, that are in charge of these facilities. Okay. But one day soon, we'll, we'll touch that, to- that subject because there, went, there was a lot that went on that probably, even though they were that short on staff, with the proper management and proper policies that couldn't have been broken, that could have been at least detained. Yeah. Possibly not have happened. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things, man, that we need to touch on and, and hopefully some, some ears that have power or have any kind of concerns about their community would be willing to do anything about this because it's only going to get worse. Yeah, I like it. Hey, if, if someone wants to follow you on social media or, or, or keep up to date with what you're doing, do you have, do you have anything you want to put out? Oh, yeah, I got a Facebook page. This is my personal page, but they're more than welcome to uh, direct message me on there. Uh, I may t- it may take me some time to get to them because I'm having uh, messages from all across the state from uh, employees and former employees, Alabama, Mississippi, California correction officers who are going through the same thing. And I'm trying to hear their stories and, and hear their concerns because – Again, a lot of people are afraid to talk about this because they're afraid of retaliation from their higher ups, their their bosses, and the GDC, which shouldn't be like that, man. It shouldn't be like that at all. No, nah, no, not at all. Well, listen, brother, I appreciate you hanging out with us once yeah, again. Thank thanks, you, man. yeah, and thanks for tuning in. As again, as I said, make sure you subscribe, you hit the notification button. Um, we're gonna have him back. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Justin. Comment down below. Let us know questions that we could ask him and things that, you know, that you would like answered about the Department of Correction. Um, Anything that y'all have, please put it in the comments below and let us know. And also, if you look in the bio. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Let me finish that and then you can say. But uh, (laughs) if you look in the bio, we'll put a link so you can you can go get to John's page. Go ahead, John. Sorry. If anybody contacts y'all with any questions or anything like that. Send me the question. I'll send you the answer, man. I don't mind answering any question, any at all. I mean, there's no question to people that don't understand the inside of that fence. Yes, sir. And that's true. If you've never worked there, I've people have always. Oh, go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man. I'm a firm believer. Knowledge is power, and 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 that's Mm -hmm. that's something that's going to have to happen for this movement to take place. Of the GDC is going to have to step in if not the federal government have to step in and 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 take take these safety measures back yeah and and unfortunately i think a lot of people uh now especially they think corrections officers are like the scum of the universe and i'm, I'm going to tell you right now i've worked with some mighty fine people and some of the most caring officers in the world um and unfortunately they just get a bad rap i mean i don't know what the deal is maybe it's in the 
the hate of law enforcement today that we're even below them. We're like the, the lowest of the low. But I'm telling you, man, people like John here, I, I, I've worked it for, you know, for a good long time. And people like John here are not, they're not, you know, one person in a group of 200. I, most, most correction officers I've interacted with and I've worked with care. So, hey, thank you so much, John. We appreciate you being on. Thank and, you. Yeah, and we will talk to you later. All right. Oh, yeah. All right. Got him. Yes. Got him. Okay.